Hello, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you on this uh, inaugural occasion. Um, it's also a distinct pleasure to share this event with renowned national leaders of academic medicine. Your visionary dean and executive director of medical affairs, Dave Borkman, and inaugural faculty inductees, senior associate dean of student affairs, and your DHHS chapter advisor, Dr. Stuart Markowitz, vice dean for medical education and student affairs, Dr. Lindsay Henson, and assistant professor of biomedical clinical science, Dr. Mario Giacomino. I am, as I learned to say in Montreal, aux anges, with the angels, uh, thrilled uh, to be here with you uh, tonight, delighted to be part of your inaugural induction ceremony. A guiding principle of your medical school is to produce physicians with the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and self-awareness to practice effective, humanistic, humanistic, patient-centered, evidence-based medicine in an increasingly diverse healthcare environment. Now, I'm gonna have more to say about that environment in a moment, but it's clear through the community engagement, service, advocacy, the care project, these things expected from you as students here that your school takes these commitments very seriously. And I have to say that we at the foundation are exhilarated that you moved so quickly after the accreditation in 2011 to add both the White Coat Ceremony and the Gold Humans and Honor Society chapter uh, to this great medical school. To the students being inducted today, let me say simply that I envy you. This 21st century of biology belongs to you. This is a moment to celebrate, to reflect on your high achievement, already at the top of many pyramids scale in a lifetime of education. I, I'm proud of you as explorers. Joining faculty members who are kindred spirits testing the edges of practice in medicine, defending our almost three millennia old humanist tradition. And at the same time, this is the remarkable moment of the 21st century, as your dean just said, inventing new paradigms, using the new media and a new code, an admixture of the binary and the genomic to create optimal care in the age of information. This is the challenge for those who are being inducted tonight. We do have to talk about a little problem in our medical culture. A problem you will face, and I know you will conquer in your professional lives. So, for 2,500 years in the West, medicine has sought to provide comfort and occasional cure, caring, and hope. And for most of that time, the only thing the physician could offer was hope. Think about it. From 460 BC, when Hippocrates first posited that the cause of disease was not the will of the gods, but something natural until the end of World War II. In our quiver, we had digitalis, penicillin, a few miraculous inoculations, and some surgery. That was it. But with the invention of modern antibiotics, the CAT scan and MRI, molecular biology, the armament at the physician's disposal changed and Cures and the dream of cures became a reality. Ironically, at the same time, there developed in all our great houses a culture of arrogance among some physicians 
and disrespect for students, patients, and colleagues. A small number, but with a huge effect. We were witnessing with this the rise of the dark elements of the hidden curriculum. I wonder how many know that phrase, hidden curriculum. A sprinkle. Hmm. Well, uh, it was invented in the early 1900s and is explained beautifully by an investigator named Hamachek, who said in a manuscript in 1999, consciously, we teach what we know. Unconsciously, we teach who we are. It's what you learn uh, when you are on the wards, being socialized into practice in the clinics, and ultimately as you transition to your professional lives. And this hidden curriculum leads to a culture of arrogance and disrespect, and it's managed to creep into our practices, medical centers everywhere. Over time, when idealistic students, and, and I know, I know that most of you entered principal idealistic and with an extraordinary desire to help. You are exposed to the behavior of superiors that belittles them, that uses public humiliation or, or focuses on the disease and not the patient. It doesn't matter what you've been taught in simulation activities with patients, in free clinics. What you experience then inhibits compassion. A and this is by far not a solved problem. On a November cover of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, last year was an incredible painting drawn by a seven-year-old girl. Maybe some of you recall this. I'll describe it to you. It's a picture of an office and the patient, seven-year-old girl, sitting on the exam table, great smile on her face. And immediately to her left and close are her family. And they're smiling as well. And way off to the right is someone in a white coat typing furiously at a keyboard with his back to the patient in the family. Now, I suggest to you that this is not the doctor's fault. The doctors didn't plan the architecture of that office. They never intended that the physician should be separated from the patient and the family and turn his back for most of the intervention and the conversation. But at the moment, the electronic health record is a halfway technology. Uh, it's, it's a problem for humanism at the moment rather than an aid for it. I remind all of the student inductees that you actually have been, but certainly now, are teachers. And you have the incredible opportunity and responsibility to model compassionate care Everyone you're with, student, patient, colleague, will be noticing everything that you do. And this is your opportunity, especially as members of the National Humanism Honor Society, to change culture. And as David knows, changing culture is not easy. And you're going to do this alongside the realizing of the potential of this century for the cure. And that is an incredible combination, which is also why I envy you. So I am, I am honored and I am proud to be with you today to celebrate the induction of 13 high achieving students and three members of the faculty into the 106th chapter of the Gold Humanism Honor Society at the Charles E. Schmidt College of Medicine at Florida Atlantic University. And as a, a surprise, 
and an honor won by the unanimous decision of the foundation. It's a great privilege to add to your number in this inaugural year a courageous pioneer, humanist, clinician, scientist, physician, dean and clinical chief of two of America's finest academic medical centers, your dean, Dr. David. and stamina to be the dean at two of America's medical schools and do it well, really well at both, is quite an achievement. And uh, you should be very pleased that you have him leading you. You, uh, faculty and students, are joining an army of GHHS members across the United States and the world with 120 chapters and over 19,000 members in training and in practice, a like-minded vanguard of your peers who represent, I think, the best hope for a future of optimal healthcare. These are physicians who understand that while you will be practicing a value-based kind of medicine, there can be no value without compassion. Compassion and empathy are part of a caring tradition which actually changes neural pathways, improves health and health outcomes, and lowers the cost of the entire system, the so-called triple aim of healthcare reform. The students have been chosen by their classmates, as David said, as exemplars of humanistic values. You are the doctors that they would turn to if they had a medical problem or there was one in their families. I think, frankly, that there can be no higher honor than to be recognized by your peers in this fashion. Now, the GHHS and the Gold Foundation will be there along with this university to help support you in your quest. Your membership as alumni and members of the GHHS is for life. We want you to get involved and stay involved. We beg you to send us your email addresses as you move from medical school to residency to fellowship and all. And please keep in touch. Write for our blog, join us at the international conferences, make your voices heard. We know you have the highest capacity to invent the future and we'd like to support you in doing it. Congratulations to all of you.